Hey, Chris. <laughs> Hi. How's it going? Oh, I'm good. Although my eyes may not belie that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you look great. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. And we have a very um, interesting topic that we'd like to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Ancestral trauma. Um, so why don't we start off the party with you? Oh, no, my friend. Why don't we start off the party with you? Because you got an interesting visual when you were I did. So full disclosure, I, we both tap into our Akashic Records, our guides, whatever, you know, is out there working with us. And I just did that. And I got an opening visual because all morning I've been kind of putting off. I usually meditate before, you know, I go on a podcast or whatever. And this morning I had a lot of other things happening. And I was like putting it off, putting off, putting off. And then finally, um, I just opened my records and the whole question that I had this morning was like, am I going to have enough to talk about? Because this is kind of an unexplored topic to me. Mm -hmm. And right when I just opened my records, I get this huge big bang kind of, um, explosion. Like it was like big bang of the universe. Mm -hmm. And I heard, you don't even know the half of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, whoa. And they said, you have a lot to learn. And so we're going to give a lot of information today, which is great because now I feel supported because I didn't do what maybe I should have as a human to prepare for this topic, which is terrible. And I'm so sorry, partner, but they're like, don't worry, we got it. And there's a lot for, for us to unpack. So I guess I'll start by um, kind of seeing what they have to say. And we'll go from there. So um, immediately they tell me what I think about ancestral trauma mm -hmm. and lineage is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, that's very interesting because even before maybe um, about a year ago, I didn't believe in it at all. And it was only a couple of exercises in my Akashic Records practicing certification programs that I was like, oh wait a minute, there, there's something here. Uh, what is it? And um, I didn't think it ex existed. And they're telling me that it does. And that I also have ancestral trauma. And that um, I knew I had past life trauma. That's for sure. I, I did carry that. But I also have um, ancestral trauma. And um, I, this is getting personal. <laughs> A, a, a lot of um, racism kind of past is coming up. Um, mm. Not that I am a racist in this life or try not to be, you know, like this is just what they're giving me right now. Um, um, and a lot of um, control issues and a lot of dominance. So that's very personal um have you yeah. ever kind of explored that for yourself yeah for sure um and i'll share something else in the in the vein of vulnerability because there's just so much to explore here um yeah. uh, i was introduced to the concepts of in between lives experiences a couple of years ago and when I um, read this book that was introduced to me vis-a-vis -vis the Akashic Records and doing work with Helen, it was a, um, a journey of souls or something along those lines by, um, by um, Brian Michael Newton. And I read it and I was like, holy shit, like this makes sense. Like it just felt right. And it's attractive when you start building a relationship with the the records right or you know this um field of crystallization if you will and this this sounds just as goofy but um when you start to develop a relationship with what we can call the akashic records or even the quantum field is what seems to make more sense for me mm -hmm. that you can get so out of your head and so out of your body where anything that is of this plane of this particular existence can almost seem trivial because there's so much else that's external to what you and we are experiencing right now. 
And so then I had this experience when I was um, coming out of a meditative state and Meredith had gotten up from this, um, this mattress that we were lying on and she went to go get dinner and I just sunk right back into it. And what I was immediately presented with was an image of me as a virile young man, blonde haired, blue eyed, in a, um, in a German beer hall. And we're like clanging steins and laughing and like there was nothing wrong in the world. And I'm panning around and I see the red banners with the, the swastika on it. And I was like, oh, and it felt very much like an experience that I'd had. And from there, it went backwards. So then I'm on ships. There's uh, folks that are enslaved. There's crusades, there's marauders, there's me with swords. There's going throughout this existence. And it was all male expressions that I was being presented with. Um, and to see the, the trauma that I had impacted as a human on others and on myself. And she had come back to get me and... And she's like, Chris, Chris, it's time. And I was like, <gasps> and I came out and she's like, what? And I was like, I'm the perpetrator. Wow. Wow. And, yeah. And I, I just, I won't ever forget that. And this understanding of the human experience and, and we, we can get sucked into um, the, the learnings and being the victims of others' actions or our own actions that have enacted trauma upon ourselves. But I had never been presented with a situation where I just went through this catalog of expressions where it was like, boom, killing, raping, pillaging, like all the way through. Oof. And that was a good counterbalance to these other expressions that I had been, been playing with over the last couple of years. So yeah, a similar experience, but it is a really good baseline from which to begin this conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, first of all, very, very, very interesting experience that you had. And I haven't had, I haven't explored completely my ancestral, like, DNA kind of lineage, which, um, which information is now coming to me, of course, because <laughs> I didn't do, didn't do the work, but, uh, beforehand, uh, but I have done past lives and, you know, in this life as Christina, um, I've had it pretty good. Like, um, I've had it really good. I haven't really had a lot of trauma. Uh, I haven't had any trauma in this life. And, um, I mean, things have been rolling pretty well. And I think of myself as a, a very good person. If there's a quarter on the floor, I'm going to be like, whose quarter is it? You know, and I don't kill people. You know, I try to be respectful and very kind to people and, you know, just the, being a decent human. But when I went back into a past life, of mine. I've been to ones where, you know, I'm just normal people or whatever, but the, there was one and it actually traumatized me to see it where I was a serial killer mm -hmm. and I was shown what I would do to the bodies. I don't even want to say it um, here, but it was a lot of mutilation and a lot of um, sawing and uh, it was really like not me at all. And I was shown this um, during a meditation and I was first of all traumatized that this was part of me. But then second, what was the takeaway? What is the takeaway from experiencing uh, something like this? Why did my soul choose to be such a monster? Mm -hmm. And it's all, it, it, all the answers that come to me are learning. And by my soul learning through different experiences, it enriches it so that I can move forward with my missions in the future. Mm -hmm. And so that it sounds terrible that I was that kind of person, but then now 
I don't even fathom doing something like that because I, I learned, you know, I mean, it, it seems logical that I wouldn't want to do that, but I do think that experience had a lot to do with the way I am now. So it, it does add a component, but, um, you know, the lineage, my, you know, father, my grandfather and so on, you know, there's a lot of, there's DNA that's been proven in science, right? And the DNA, you do carry on DNA. And it's very interesting when they look into people who are adopted and then the adoptee finds their uh, birth parents and they're, they're in the same industry of career or something like that. So that is very interesting. And I know that's very science-based, but there's an energetic level to that as well. So you're passing on energy completely makes sense that that is occurring. Yep. Now, a lot of this presupposes the possibility of reincarnation would be the, the most, um, the most known term for what this would be called and that you have an experience, you learn, you apply the learnings, you come back and, uh, and, right. and move on. There's, and I want to piggyback on the, the, the DNA, there's the, the energetic being, right? So you could call it the soul or the higher self or something that's just bigger than us and the ancestral version. Now, similar to you, um, I've, I've had it really easy relative to other people's experiences um, from 1973 on. I also believe that I had a hand in selecting, you know, being... Chris McCann and choosing my parents for a certain reason and that my brother and sister came into this lifetime with an agreement and that my kids and and Meredith and it is to me when I have these experiences and start to connect the dots it just feels right and it makes sense I mean it really is like a choose your own adventure book there's no wrong answer you can just if you choose to do this choose to do this these decision trees uh, just keep expanding but to that end um, even though I didn't have any overt trauma enacted upon me, coming out of the birth canal itself can be traumatic. And wow. what your parents are experiencing, uh, whether you're coming into a joyful home, is it stable? Are they young? Are they older? Um, is the mother happy? Is it nurturing? And, you know, is there what's going on in her life? There's there's so many external focus or external um external uh, pressures that are part of this. And, and then just the act of coming through the birth canal where you're in this warm, largely loving incubated experience and then just ripped out of there. And that's trauma. And in doing work with, with other individuals from a coaching perspective, like, Oh, look, like there's nothing wrong with what I've, I mean, I haven't had any of this. I haven't um, been the victim of, um, any sort of sexual molestation or, you know, trauma or abuse or anything, right? But there's capital S trauma, right? The very overt um, ones that require oppression of those that are underserved. And then there's a small S trauma. And I think the birth canal is a shared experience that most of us have had. It, it was grown in a, um, in a test tube, so to speak. Uh, and it's a shared trauma that we all have. Now, in doing work with someone um, just last week, and it was this conversation, like, well, no, like everything's actually been great. Like I've had these curated experiences. I'm an only child, like everything has been fantastic. And I said, but there's to then begin to explore the possibility of these different forms of trauma, be them energetic trauma, which you're carrying from other existences, albeit on this planet or anywhere else. And then you have the, the genetic trauma, right? Which is passed on um, via blood, right, via your DNA from your great, 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 great grandparents, et cetera. Now, what triggered all of this for me um, was end of July, I read this study that was published on the transatlantic slave trade. And this is, you know, post George Floyd being murdered, you know, but certainly there's an awareness of this oppression. And is this legacy of rape from the slave trade that was being shown in today's genetics uh, and how, and just the conditions that um, these folks were, were living under. So, and I'll, I'll summarize it, but they had talked to about 50,000 research participants um, from both sides of the Atlantic. 
and it cross-referenced those with records from slave ships that had moved 12 and a half million men, women, and children between 1515 and 1865, and some two million of them died on the journey. And that's tremendous. So they wanted to compare the genetic results to those shipping manifests to see how they agreed, how they disagreed. And this was a uh, geneticist at 23andMe, and they recruited uh, some of the participants. Um, they found that while the genetic contributions from major African populations largely corresponded to what they expected, uh, based on just the records that were available, there were, were significant exceptions. Um, an example of that would be that most Americans of African descent have roots in Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo, which was in line with a major slave group. But the Nigerian ancestry was overrepresented in African Americans in the US. And they think this was because of the intracontinental slave trade, which brought them from the Caribbean. The, the reasons were, were very grim as to why there were fewer genetic connections between African Americans and the Senegambia region, um, just based on the number who had disembarked in the slave ships. And it's because they were often transported from rice plantations in Africa to the US, and, and they were often rampant with malaria and had high mortality rates, which likely led to the reduced genetic representation of that sect in African Americans today. Oh. The, the government, our government and other governments and slave owner practices had a huge impact on the genetics as well. And despite the fact that more than 60% of the enslaved people that were brought to the Americas were men, um, comparisons of genetics reveal a strong bias toward African American, or I'm sorry, African female contributions in the modern gene pool. And the reason for this is just incredible, but much of it was attributed to the rape uh, of the enslaved African women by white men and other forms of sexual exploitation. Like, you know, we'll give you freedom if you birth enough children. Um, the imbalance was also pronounced in Latin America. Meredith and I, when we were in uh, uh, Cartagena, Colombia, uh, we spent some time with folks that were indigenous there. Um, and the trauma that was impacted upon the, those that were native to the land, indigenous to the land, by the Spanish, where 70% of the slaves who survive um, the ship voyages disembarked um, compared to the United States. That's, you know, 30, uh, three out of 10 would die. And that's just incredible. So in, in the, the U.S., it would prom promise uh, or promote marriages among slaves to ensure the children would form the next generation of this forced labor pool. But the, the ratio was actually 17 Ameri African females reproducing for every one African male. And what that means is that they were raped over and over and over and over again. Mm. Um, so in the British colonized Americas, the ratio was closer to 1.5 or two African women for every African man contributing to the gene pool. So, <sighs> They can tell, right? So some anywhere from 500 to 200 years, this range of, and being able to go back and look at the DNA of the folks that are alive with us today, our peers, and to see this um, trauma that was impacted, you know, generations ago, and they still carry it with them. We can still carry it with us. And to that end, and I think the science bears out that um, ancestral trauma, and something that happened 300 years ago, 400 years ago, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 years ago can have as much of an impact on us today as Christina and Chris um, as it would if it actually had happened to us when we were born. So it's naive to then dismiss the possibility of trauma uh, from an ancestral perspective or an energetic perspective um, as a way to make these other parts of our lives whole, to heal them. So I'll pause there because I know we just dumped an awful lot, but. Yeah. Wow. Passed. No, that, that, that was great. Um, you know, as far as uh, uh, the study, because um, obviously I haven't seen any studies um, on that. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, the, that's what the, the slave trade minimally from the 1500s, correct? Correct. Yeah, like so that's like 500-year-old trauma. Yes. 
that is still in the people who experience that. Have you had a, have you ever uh, done your DNA? No, I haven't. I have. Um, and mine's dominantly um, Western European. No surprise mm -hmm. there, right? Mm -hmm. But I've got you know zero African American and um, zero mm -hmm. Indigenous of the United States, so it, it it's all European. But even though you, as Christina King today, um, are predominantly European, mm -hmm. genetically speaking, do you still um, assume the possibility or take on the possibility of you having had experiences where you were not of European descent and that that impacts your day to day? Were you you mean, uh, you could have been indigenous. Like soul lives. wise, but not DNA wise. Correct. Oh gosh. Yeah. Oh, I've been to, I've explored a lot of past lives, but, um, I haven't explored my, like my blood, uh, ancestral DNA. So more, mine is more of a soul ancestry. Yeah. I, I've been a part of a lot of different kinds of groups. Right. And I know that, um, I'm pretty sure about that, which is interesting because then, you know, that's, I'm so sure about that, but there's no science to that except that I've done it. So mm -hmm. now, you know, it, it, it's getting me thinking, um, because I have been doing some, uh, family tree on my father's side because my uncle did my mother's side. Mm -hmm. My mother's side is the one that's more of from America start. Right. Mm -hmm. So th that's the one that goes, um, from, you know, uh, the, the latest, or I guess the earliest settlers, you know, that kind of thing. But then my father's is more recent European and, um, mm -hmm. But, you know, now it's like, wow, I'm going to go into my records and I'm really going to explore uh, the tree and go into the tree there. Um, we've my my uncle, he's a brilliant guy. He's found a lot of stories um, on my mom's side. But I, you know, it's hard to find the stories on my uh, dad's side. Um, so because I guess I could hire somebody and do that. But yeah, but as far as like um, soul, soul uh, reincarnations, there there have been a lot. And I've it, my very first time that I ever did like my own past life regression, I was part of a tribe in Siberia. It was like a thousand years ago, uh -huh. like, even like a date that I couldn't even comprehend when I got it, and I couldn't even pronounce my name. I asked like, "What's my name?" and you know, whatever. I couldn't even pronounce my name, but it looked actually very similar. Um, I'm five, eight in this life. But at that time it was like, I was like under five foot. Mm -hmm. And so I just look like a flattened fatter version of myself, which, um, <laughs> is very interesting. And I was in Siberia and part of a, a tribe and I got killed. And I was still, if I were an artist, I could actually draw the face. It's still in my mind. Seeing that guy is like, I got tapped on the shoulder and I turned around and I just saw this, boom, lights out. And that was my first um, experience exploring that. In passing, have I spoken about my two past lives with the, the weight issue? No. no. Oh, okay. So that. in this life, I'm very overweight. Um, a good 100 pounds overweight. And so I have a lot of food things going on, a lot of emotions around food. So it's my addiction, uh, really. You know, some people smoke, some people drink, I eat. And um, I've been working through that for quite a long time and I've made a lot of progress. But I was interested, like, did I carry some of these eating issues that I have? Because it, it you know, it, it didn't seem, it, you know, some people, it seems like an easy fix when they're overweight, they go on a diet, they exercise, and then they're good. Right. But for me, it was like, it was just deeper. And I was like, what in the, why is this so hard for me? Why is it so hard for me? And this has been a journey for years, like this kind of mentality. So I said, you know, I'm going to go in and look at my past lives and see if there are any, anything, uh, any relationship to, um, what I'm experiencing now. Mm -hmm. So I immediately got, um, I got shown a life where I was a man in France and I didn't really get a date, but it was like maybe two or 300 years ago. Um, and I was imprisoned. 
and I was put in a very dark dungeness kind of area where I, my movement was restricted and I was not given any food. So I died from starvation. Wow. I didn't have enough food. Right. Mm -hmm. And then immediately I didn't know I was going to be transported to another one. I was shown a different life where I was impacted by food and I was a child in, um, I was a, a little boy in, on some Island in like South Pacific, you know, wow. okay. and in like a tribe situation where my father was the chief. And he was, he was like the chief of the, the whole tribe. And he was a very, very fat man, a very big guy. And everyone was big. And that was part of uh, being wealthy in a tribe. Like you have to be big because it shows your wealth and your prosperity, right? And I was a skinny little boy and they kept trying to get me to eat. Everything was like eat, 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 eat. And I didn't really want to eat. I was just hungry and I was, you know, I was an active kid. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do, but they just were forcing all this food on me and trying to make it happy and a celebration and everything. So I carried those things with me. Uh, those two, I was told that there were some other ones that there's some also direct um, uh, effects that I'm experiencing now, but those two were the big ones. And that can be completely make sense with, uh, you know, the amounts that eat in the mindset that I've always had, even as a kid, you know, like a, a line at a buffet or I didn't go to buffets often, but you know, like at a barbecue, I would be obsessed with getting the biggest piece of chicken. I wasn't even a fat kid, actually. <laughs> uh, I was so active, but I was like, this is my piece of chicken. And it was like, I need two just in case. <laughs> It was like this food hoarding mentality almost. And that uh, was young. And so, yeah, I mean, I believe it. And I've been working through that and a lot of other things uh, to where I am now. And I feel like I'm on a, a great path to recovery. <laughs> I'm recovering a, now. That's a great example of, of how to, to do this work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, wow. To, to be able to then gain context around why so one it requires uh, an element of compassion for yourself right mm -hmm. and, and trying to find and trying to understand and, and gain that context um and knowing and so, well, at least have been open to the idea of it's not just something that happened when christina king was born and, and developed a relationship with um with you know with uh, going to old country buffet and finding the biggest piece of chicken um it's that you know, this has been going on for quite a while. And to then gain some insight onto, as to why you would have chosen, this is one of your particular projects to work on. Your relationship with food is oversimplifying it, but it's really your relationship with being enough, right? And, mm -hmm. and having this agreement with your, with your corporal body where you know it's very much a vessel and you have the, the higher version of Christina um, that's that's really just kind of renting out to this body and 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 honoring it. And that we're going to afford you this body because you're gonna to want to work on not just your relationship with food, and then it's again an oversimplification, but you know, your relationship with yourself and you're addressing something that you've been working on for a couple thousand years. Yep. Um, and what I love about this work, so it's the, the past life stuff is really interesting to me and I don't want to discount any of that. Mm -hmm. What I found to be even more interesting was why, why, why then did I self select to be, you know, to have, you know, Jim and Sharon as my parents, uh, to be in this body, um, to have blonde hair and blue eyes in this lifetime, uh, to not finish college and just start having accumulated experiences. And in spite of all of it, everything worked out really well. Um, and what's my responsibility uh, in all of this? Responsibility is a, a really interesting word for me. And it's something that I continue to spend time evaluating. And what we've selected to work on, you know, in this particular lifetime, these agreements that we've made with ourselves and um, with any guides or, or, or gods or whatever you want to call it. Like if, if, if this is a concept that resonates with you, it's an interesting idea to sit in meditation 
say, well, why did I um, select to have web toes, right? What's, you know, and, and knowing that you, you know, took on all of it, the, the positive and the negative, the, the strengths and the not so strengths. The illumination of what needs to be worked on, what needs to be unearthed, and, and this is a process. Um, and illumination is really seeing what areas of our life need to be brought to light. Um, just like sunlight illuminates so we can see and going to where the darkness is. And we know that the sun rises and it begins to illuminate the landscape. And at nighttime, when the sun is down, you know, it's, you can't see everything. <laughs> but when the sun rises, it illuminates. So when you go to where it's dark, which is a natural occurrence, um, it provides this opportunity to surface these shadows or these less enlightened areas for us to work on, right? So the identification of these is, is the first piece. The second thing that you've then touched on is bringing an understanding to it. And who are the people, the places, the context, you know, what, and, and, and it helps to bring compassion around this um, area or part of our lives that we're working on. Um, and without judgment and saying, okay, well then it makes sense as to why I would have this. And you, again, um, Christina gave a great example of this where if you were robust, that meant that you were wealthy and you were strong and virile and, um, and to have that. So you've had multiple occurrences leading into this one where you're, you're reckoning, um, that. So we you know, illuminate, bring these things to light. We understand and gaining context and having compassion, you know, for ourselves and for others most importantly for ourselves, and then the healing and, um, and what, do, what needs to be made whole, what, um, what is it that um, needs to be brought to completion and brought to wholeness? And healing can seem like there's something wrong with us, but what I like um, to perceive healing as is this rounding out or this completion of this particular aspect of ourselves. So thanks for sharing that experience. It's, um, it's a beautiful example of how this work can help to provide context and clearing um, for challenges to make room for what's next. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned before about your past um, with narcissism. So I'm very curious. Do you see any link um, you know, similar to mine, I know you haven't gone, you know, into past lives or whatever, but you know, do you, in your exploration of that, because I'm sure, you know, you've also done a lot of work, it, you know, did you reveal anything that was pretty deeply ingrained, like a, a, an issue or, you know, anything? Um, so I've done work in, in past lives, but it has been where it's just shown up to me. Right. So it's like just going through a photo album and it's like, okay, what's the most relevant one? So I get these experiences. And, and I think largely for most of my life, I didn't understand what was going on, but they're just dreams or visions or anything else. Um, so an example of one would be, and this is not necessarily related to your question, but I've, I'd had this persistent dream uh, from the time that I was a kid that I, had buried a body in my backyard and it's like wow like oh my gosh like I, I killed someone and this body is still sitting there somewhere in Jackson Michigan right and someone's going to find out and they're gonna find out about me and, and what I did and was persistent up until I actually um, identified it recognized it and got some context around it and this feeling, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, and I'm sure you can relate, that you've done something really, really bad, and someone's going to find you out, um, could lead to this form of narcissism, because you're, you're acting as if something is not true, right? You're acting as if you're above um, a certain behavior and presenting things in a certain way. 
So thanks for bringing this up because I'm going to heal right here and now. Oh, <laughs> well, we're getting personal today. <laughs> right. The, the idea in that I did kill someone, which I, I now know that I have over and over again. Just to be clear, not as Chris. Not as Chris. Okay. Just wanted to be clear. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, but you still get those, like, you can, I can get it. I can understand. But this one particular instance where this body was buried and I didn't want to be found out was I was a young boy. I was like 13 or 14 years old and it was self-defense and I had to protect myself. And then I just buried this body in the backyard and, and it was found out. Um, years later, like it just happened, like they found the bones or something. Um, but that I had no choice. I was put into a position where it was either myself or him and I defended myself and that required a level of spiritual forgiveness and acceptance that certainly was not available to me five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And that the human experience is very human and we choose to be here because it is tough and because we have the ability to learn rapidly and to evolve because it's such a harsh environment in, in many aspects for us to do this work. And so it just stood to reason that, yes, I have done that. And yes, I have been a blonde haired, blue eyed Nazi who was just doing what we're supposed to be doing and, and, and championing the cause. And, and it wasn't even that experience, Christina, it wasn't even like I was anti-Semitic or anything. I was just pro, pro Germany, pro my friends and, and pro um, doing the work. Yeah. You were sucked into it kind of. Yeah. And the same with the crusades and the same with, you know, uh, and, and on both sides, right. It wasn't just on the Christian side. It was very much on the Islamic side and, um, and all of it and pirates and slave trade and, and being enslaved and, and all these things. I, I don't believe that it's a linear experience in that we go from one lifetime to the next lifetime, to the next lifetime, to the next lifetime. I just, that to me just oversimplifies it. It very I also much so, find that to be true, by the way. Yeah. You're right. It's just like going through a um, like a Kodak a Kodak slideshow, right? And it's like, oh, this one, boom, you put it in, and and being able to have multiple experiences. And where I'll give you an example of something I had. Robert Peng is a a Qigong uh, teacher. He's online, and he had had this experience where he was um, secluded, and I'm, I'm probably getting the story wrong, but where his teacher had put him into a small dark room for so many days to where he lost it was sensory deprivation. And he was a, a young man. I was like, gosh, like I wish I had that sort of experience so I could at least relate to it and take some of those learnings um, into this lifetime. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, I think I can. I was like, what if I actually just called upon the most relevant life experience that I've had or that somebody else has had, and then just insert myself into it, take the learnings, apply it, and not actually have to go do that. It fucking works. Yeah. So just being able to insert yourself into another shared experience that someone has had, which then presupposes that you have and this identity with the we-ness of all of it and not the I-ness of all of it. Um, and this connection at a energetic level that we have with each other, God, source, whatever, I don't know. Whatever's bigger than us, whatever we want to call it. So then you can just, it's like on demand streaming. <laughs> Hey, you know, that's where we're all going. So <laughs> yeah. same as spirit world. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's just interesting to apply this. And so when, when I work with people that this is not something I can just like throw up all over them. I'm like, Oh, well, blah, 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 blah. it's that it doesn't work well that way. So I've, I've learned that about doing this work with people and just helping to, you know, nudge along, uh, this progression and that there has been some level of trauma, whether they're aware of it or not, whether they're open to the possibility of it or not. 
and then being able to work with someone where I could talk to Christina, who may or may not resonate with a lot of these ideas, but energetically, I'm still helping them clear and clean and then bring things to light without their conscious awareness of it. They just feel better, right? And it's a hard thing to describe. Like, I don't know, Chris, I just feel better, right? Um, it and, is, yeah. Yeah, so it's just like you're just going in and helping to clean up. <laughs> it's a privilege. I'm, uh, I'm blown away by the fact that we get to do this. Agreed, agreed. And you know that you, all of what you said kind of brings me back to, you know, why are we carrying this? You know, I, I questioned that as well. Like, why did I bring this trauma into my life? Mm -hmm. What purpose is it serving me? And I found this to be true that I kind of, it's kind of like two answers. The first one is I do have to have a struggle in this life. And this is a big one. This is a theme that I chose to endure as mm -hmm. Christina. Um, and, and so it was already kind of like, this is the, this is the struggle and it is a struggle because, you know, this is my experience and I will say it's, it's a struggle. And so, you know, that goes back to, that's the word I choose to do, to deal with, like to understand it for myself and my experience is not anyone else's. So that helps me have compassion for everybody else when they said this happened to you and immediately one would think, Oh, well, that happened to you. That's not a big deal. But to mm -hmm. them, it's a big deal, you know? Yeah. So that, that helps me. But the second thing is actually related to that, which is, you know, I feel that I'm also on a, a journey of learning um, a, as a healer, mm -hmm. healing myself, but having more of an enriched, um, enriched experience helps me to also heal others. So it spills over to helping others. So it's kind of, you know, I always think of it as a ripple effect because if I help somebody else, their help that they received also helps somebody else indirectly, directly all, all across the map. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it helps me be, become a better person and a, a better service. And this wasn't, this is still not fixed. What is fixed, you know? It's still something I undergo every day, um, you know, as far as like, uh, you know, and I, I do say the word addiction with it, uh, my addiction. Um, now, DNA wise, there's a history of addiction in my family. I won't go into that because there's a lot of my family that are still alive, but uh, my father's passed and indirectly it was because of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Um, my grandfather, I will speak cause he is a recovered alcoholic mm -hmm. and, um, you know, there's arguably other people in my, um, family that have uh, uh, substance abuse issues. So DNA wise, this does make sense that I have it as well. Now, um, I'm, I'm curious onto your take about victim being a victim, Chris, because one can argue you know, there are a lot of, one, one of my big things is people victimizing themselves or being a victim, right? And this is going to sound maybe pretty harsh, uh, but um, my big pet peeve is to feel like a victim, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that I'm privileged that, okay, yeah, I struggle with eating issues, whatever, you know, you can say that. But at the same time, you, you know, I haven't endured any kind of physical abuse, no emotional abuse, no sexual trauma, nothing like that. Uh, never been discriminated against. Well, you know, like that was traumatic or whatever. And, and so, you know, how dare I say, you know, anything about victim mentality when I haven't had it that hard. I get it. I get it. I get it. But I, I feel like there comes a point where when you do acknowledge that you are a victim of some sort of something, mm -hmm. that it is your responsibility to explore that, which is what I've done. And it can be very complicated and it could be, be an exploration that might never end in this lifetime. And, you know, maybe you don't get peace, but at least 
you're trying, which means you're learning. And what do you, what do you say about like being a victim? And I, I say it because I, there are people in my life that play that card. And when I see it from the outside, it just infuriates me because I'm like, you know, am I oversimplifying it? But because I'm not them, but am I, you know, am I, I'm, am I being just too much of a bitch about it? It was just like, get out, get, get out of your own way and realize that you can take steps to make yourself feel better, even just a little bit, you know, Chris. Thoughts? Yeah. But that's not where all of us are. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm really crystal fucking clear on the fact that any, anything I've gone through, I put myself through. I made a conscious decision to do it. Oh, and that hasn't changed at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I've known that. I remember when I made a decision to lead a certain lifestyle and to go accumulate experiences as opposed to becoming a high school football coach, right? Which would right. have been like the, yep. which would have just fit. Uh, I was like, no, I'm, uh, I'm going to start playing around with, um, you know, uh, chemical <laughs> chemicals and, and, and create and, and art and travel and, screw things up and then, and have a great story to tell. Um, so these, there's like at at certain points, I was like, Oh my God, why doesn't it stop? Right. Like, um, (laughs) like it just, it wouldn't like, you can see where, when someone gets sucked into the system where it just begins to perpetrate itself and it's hard to get out of it. Yeah. And that hit me like mid thirties. I'm like, okay, it's kind of, it's cute. It's done. Um, it's, it was just like a 20 year experiment that went on 19 years too long. Uh, and I was lucky enough because I'm privileged enough to have been able to just bootstrap my way out of it and then find myself in California and living a great life. And my kids still talk to me, which is amazing. Um, but it's not for us in this work to tell people that they're wrong. Right. It's for us in this work to provide a container for them to begin to find some answers to questions that have been nagging them. I, I can't sit there and say, well, just this, 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 and this are true. Look, all of this sounds fantastical to some people and I can be wrong about all of it. Even if it's just a great fucking story, right? There's healing to be found in that story. And I know that I am a much better human uh, and how I show up and, and how I, you know, try to operate in this world, never perfect, at least, you know, from the outside, from the outside looking in, or I'm always going to be hard on myself, but it always comes from a place of, you know, of what's not just for my highest good, but what's for the highest good of the people that are connected to us. I think I kind of answered your question. Um, the, and it's the, it was enlightening for me to move or to transcend compassion for others, which I find to come fairly easy. It's like, well, of course you did that. It makes sense. I get it. No judgment. The hard part for me has been finding compassion for myself. Yep. Ditto. (laughs) Once that's happened, and it's, of course, Chris, of course you in this lifetime had murdered someone because it was self-defense, or of course you were, um, you know, killing Christians in, you know, in in the Middle East because, you know, you're, you're, it was very much like what you did. It was, um, you know, it was for the prophet Muhammad and um, it was just this sense of religious zealousness and like, this is the way, right? It was of the times. It's hard even to sit there and have, I'll look at Joe Biden as an example, right? And what I really have a hard time with from a political sense is that someone may have done something 40 or 50 years ago and that how someone operated 40 or 50 years ago is how they then operate today. Mm-hmm. Some people do that, 
right? Some people get stuck and they repeat the same patterns that they've been repeating, you know, throughout their existence. But people also can transcend previous thoughts, beliefs, actions, deeds. That's been my experience. Um, I distinctly remember having conversations with my sister when I was like a young, uh, like a teenager. Like, you can't date black people, right? That's not bad. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Right. And now I have two black children. And um, this constant growth and evolution and questioning things and being open to change and, and, and unlearning certain things that maybe we were conditioned to take on when we came into this lifetime and then applying some thinking to it and then relearning and then applying and that's that's where the magic is and fortunately there's enough self-awareness now to where i can unlearn a lot of those things or i haven't learned a lot and um, have healed and um, i just I always had the sense that if i ended up doing more good in the world than bad that things would kind of even out um, I think I've jumped that shark, <laughs> but by no means um, was I perfect. I made a ton of mistakes and hurt a lot of people. Um, and I don't feel like I owe anything to anyone other than to myself, right? And just fixing my own shit. Yeah. Um, still working on the narcissism question there, but that's that's where I sit with victimhood is compassion and and trying to energetically resonate with someone where maybe I, my words aren't going to be able to help, but how we can build this container, whether it's for three seconds, 30 seconds, three minutes, two hours, whatever that is, to help someone feel some sort of an energetic shift or a possibility and just start them on that path to illumination, understanding and healing. Yeah. You know, um, you're absolutely right. You know, it's hard. I think you're your own worst enemy and you're, and I have been my own abuser. I can say that mm -hmm. I'm my own abuser. I'm the worst to myself and, um, I'm learning to get over that. Mm -hmm. But you know, as far as the, the work that I do, even before, you know, I knew, I always kind of knew I was intuitive. Right. But even before understanding that about myself, when I was a teacher in Korea, I would encounter people where I could see outsiders could see, or maybe it was my intuition. I don't know, but I could see how it would just be a couple of steps to be in a completely different headspace or experience or whatever. And it was so frustrating because I cared about people so much to, to see people wallowing in victimhood yeah. that it was hard for me to accept that because I'm like, Oh, you know, like just listen to me. And that's, that's still a learning experience, obviously, because you know, I, it, it may be a big lesson that I have to learn. It's like, I can't, I'm not trying to control people, but there, there's an element of being there for people when they're ready mm -hmm. and when they're not ready, that's their battle or that's their experience. And that's something that they have to work through. I can only be the tool if they want help from me. I do admit that I had to fire a client because, you know, out of the gate, she was pretty strong. And then it became very clear that we were, it was the same thing every coaching session. And as a coach, it's my responsibility to move people forward, but only if they're ready. I can't push her forward. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, there were like, it was pretty clear what needed to happen for her to move forward. And I still very much um, adore this person and, uh, and I, I would hope for the best, but there's nothing I can do further. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hit, I hit a wall because there were some things that needed to happen in order for her to get out of her own way. And that's something I can't do, you know, and that kind of, I, I, I'll use the term loosely powerlessness is something I, I struggle to accept because I just care so much. And I'm like, I just want progress. But 
you know, it's everyone else is leading a, a different mission and I have to just kind of, you know, sit and wait and wait and wait. And then when I'm called to duty, I, I go in. Yeah. Well, that was a lot over the yeah. course of an hour, Christina. It was. It got personal. It got deep. Good. I, I, I just want to say thank you for sharing so much of yourself because that, you know, there, there's an element of vulnerability, which I ain't afraid to go to, obviously, um, that, you know, it presents when we, we start to get a little bit more personal than just talking about, you know, surface level kind of issues. So thank you. No, thank you. And just for being able to hold space. I'm, uh, <laughs> it's like part of my, my, like even Instagram cleanup effort has been just to re authenticize the audience and mm -hmm. um, it requires just radical honesty and transparency and vulnerability. And that's a space from which I want to continue operating. And, Absolutely. Um, it certainly, you know, um, can make me appear to be more human from, you know, from the other side, from someone who doesn't necessarily know me. Um, but it's been a rich fucking life. <laughs> and, yeah. And um, I just, I love being able to help. So when, when people are ready, we, just, we, we go to work because that's, that's right. our responsibility. That's what we agreed to. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you know, I just got a takeaway that popped in my mind. Mm -hmm. And um, of course I want to hear yours if you have one uh, takeaway and this is channeled. This is not me. If you're listening to this and this topic does resonate with a lot of people actually um, take it take a take a look at yourself and not in a critical way but kind of in a detached way and really go into I wish I could say this, see, show this vision. Let me try to describe it. Really go into your blueprint, your map, and you can see it. You don't need an expert to do this. Um, really take a step back from yourself. Look at your bl blueprint. And what you really need to look at are these themes that keep recurring in your life. It could be just one. Uh, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. And just focus in on it and you don't have to have a solution to it. But what you do have to know is that it might be a little more complicated than you think it might be. And, um, you know, just see what pops into your mind when you look at this area that keeps happening for you. And just like we explored a lot of soul um, ancestral trauma and DNA ancestral trauma, you know, just ask yourself, just ask, you know, what, what's connected to this space that I'm looking at right now and see what you get. And it might be just a, a, the tidbit that you need to start turning a different kind of gear. Yeah. Just lights a different fire. I like that. A little pilot light. Mm-hmm. Uh, the theme that we've had this week in our household has been um, around what's the opportunity here. And so similar in that yours is the same. And um, where if we just operate from a place uh, and, and using this as just the overarching theme of being able to sit for a second, um, if we're operating from a place where everything is for our own highest good, it's all about our own evolution and our, and our journey. And while things might seem very challenging or you keep repeating the same things or there's a level of stuckness to just take a slight step back say, huh, what's the opportunity here? What am I supposed to learn? Where maybe you can just remove the emotions from it and some of the other context and the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves um, to justify it. And that seems to have opened up um, something in, in these four walls this week, um, even around the move and the, the, um, the lack of it making any sense whatsoever as to how and why we're here. What's the opportunity? That would be my takeaway. Awesome. Well, thank you, Chris, for your time. And thank you. yeah, it's been You're awesome. To wake up. Yep. <laughs> See you next time. All right. Thanks, Christina.